Five and Five, the series where I go over five scientific papers in five minutes or more. The topic this time, testosterone in sports. Oh, jeez. With the amount of very concerned individuals coming out of the woodwork to express their not at all rooted in bigotry reservations about transgender women competing in women's sports, one could be mistaken for thinking that testosterone is a magical athleticism MacGuffin, and that measuring it predicts victory with such consistency that you wonder why they even bother going through with the competition at all. But is testosterone really the hormonal midichlorians that common knowledge would have us believe? He asks, rhetorically to set up the rest of the video. So, before we get into the studies proper, I'm going to cheat a little bit and use my background in exercise physiology to explain to you a little bit about how the endocrine system works. So, you have endocrine glands throughout your body, and they secrete hormones into your bloodstream. Now, that means that every single hormone that you secrete is going to touch every single tissue in your body. But, not every hormone works on every tissue. This is because hormones require specific receptors to carry out their functions. So, testosterone needs testosterone receptors, and insulin needs insulin receptors. Now, without these, it doesn't matter how much of a hormone you have circulating throughout your bloodstream, it's not gonna have any effects. That also means that the amount of receptors that you have matters just as much as the amount of hormone that you have. So, for example, in type two diabetes and in anabolic steroid usage, your body gets bombarded with these hormones so much that they start losing receptors. This means that the same amount of insulin or the same amount of testosterone is gonna have a smaller effect on the cell than it used to be. This is called down-regulation, a loss of receptors. Likewise, we can do the opposite. So after a workout, your body needs both insulin and testosterone in order to help facilitate recovery. So you can add receptors. This is called upregulation. I'm explaining how they work because it's important context for interpreting these next few studies. Testosterone is important for athletic ability, that's certainly true, but too many people seem to think that that means the more athletic you are, the more testosterone you must have, and that's, well, wrong. In a study titled, Why do Endocrine Profiles in Elite Athletes Differ Between Sports, published in Clinical Diabetes and Endocrinology, researchers looked at testosterone levels across elite athletes in different sports. They found that powerlifters, you know, the sport that is the purest test of raw strength imaginable, have much lower levels of testosterone compared to every other sport. In fact, powerlifters, weightlifters, which are different sports, and ice hockey players all had lower T levels than canoers, which is sure to rile up all the types of people who unironically call people soy boys. Actually, every single sport they measured showed average T levels that were below the roughly 23 nanomoles per liter average of the general population, which you can see with this professionally drawn line I added. The study makes it clear that they can't say for sure whether or not these T levels represent genetic predispositions to certain sports, like height to basketball, or if they're adaptations to those sports, but knowing what I do about how hormone receptors work, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that athletes adapt to certain sports by upregulating their cells to accommodate testosterone more efficiently, resulting in greater effects at lower levels of production. That makes papers like this one, Testosterone and Sport, Current Perspectives, published in Hormones and Behavior, kind of baffling. In what is supposedly a report on the current understanding of testosterone in sport, this paper raises more questions than it answers, at least for me. For example, it points to some interesting research that testosterone levels in athletes and even their fans following a win increases, while the losing athlete's T decreases. And before you fill out your application to the Lobster Fan Club, not only is the effect temporary, but both the increase following a win and decrease following a loss is most prevalent in dominant-minded individuals, also known as assholes. Claims like this make it tough to pin down whether testosterone is an explanatory or response variable, and leads to some pretty inconclusive declarations for a review paper. One statement in particular concerning a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH, says that because the condition increases androgens, it may offer women with CAH a competitive advantage. They also say that women with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, meaning they have the hormone in their body but their receptors don't pick them up, should have no advantage because they can't benefit from the testosterone. But as reasonable as these seem, they're only hypotheses. They haven't actually tested to see if women with CAH do have an advantage, or if women with AIS have a disadvantage. I only bring up this study because the 1% of transphobes who actually make an effort to look at the science will often find in quotes something like this, well, parts of it anyway, to justify excluding trans women from sports. Keep that in mind because it brings us to the next article. 
Out of Bounds, a critique of the new policies of hypoandrogenism in elite female athletes, published in the American Journal of Bioethics. This one more or less centers on the case of Castor Semenya, the South African sprinter who, despite being a cis woman, had her gender and sex questioned by her competitors due to her appearance. That's not editorializing, by the way. The event that triggered the extremely public and dehumanizing investigation into Castor's body wasn't brought about by some outlandish performance, but because the competitors she beat thought she looked too masculine. There's some great information in here about the role gender plays in sex separation in sports, and the history of invasive gender testing by the IOC and other organizations that may be the topic of another video, but what I want to highlight is the article's discussion of CAH and CAIS. The C here just stands for complete. From earlier. CAIS, which remember is insensitivity to masculinizing hormones, should be a detriment to sports performance if testosterone is the main source of athletic ability. But what we actually find is that women with CAIS are overrepresented at the elite level in sports. Likewise, CAH results in an overabundance of masculinizing hormones, but women with CAH are disproportionately affected by short stature, obesity, dysregulation of mood hormones, and unpredictable, life threatening, salt losing crises. To quote the article, Optimal levels of testosterone is one of many factors that is necessary for athletes to achieve their own personal best, but comparing testosterone levels across individuals is not of any apparent scientific value. And if you think that's spicy, if I had to pick one thing to take away from this article, it would be this. Despite the many assumptions about the relationship between testosterone and athletic advantage, there is no evidence showing that successful athletes have higher testosterone levels than less successful athletes. That paper was a step in the right direction, but it's still an incomplete overview of testosterone and gender in sports. Our last paper, Gender Transports, Privileging the Natural in Gender Testing, Debates for Intersex and Transgender Athletes, published in the American Journal of Bioethics, highlights some of the pitfalls that even a well-meaning author can fall into when trying to defend athletes with intersex or disorders of sexual development. When trying to contrast biological and genetic variations to things like doping, the previous authors anchored themselves to a position that privileged biology as the path to legitimacy. And since trans people competing in sport technically are introducing foreign materials into their bodies, this creates a division between people with intersex conditions and trans people where there doesn't need to be one. Instead, more attention and research should be spent fighting the dimorphic understanding of sex in competitive fields so that intersex and trans athletes alike aren't seen as potential imposters. <sighs> 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 None of this is to say that testosterone isn't important to athletes, it definitely is. But it's far from being the most important factor in determining athletic performance. Add to that that there's so much interpersonal physiological variability, it's borderline useless to try to compare testosterone levels from person to person. So anyone who tries to use this overly reductive understanding of endocrinology to attack women with androgen conditions or trans women is as unscientific as they are bigoted. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and if you didn't like this video, please leave a comment and tell me why, especially if I got something wrong. It actually very much matters to me if I get all of my facts right. And hey, if you want to be really cool, support me on Patreon. Maybe if I have a little bit more financial independence, I can find time to actually use that gem that I obviously don't.